This is week two of our visioning series. Because as we mentioned at the beginning of service, without vision, the people perish. And a church without vision winds up lost. A church that has no vision about who they are and what they are specifically called to do as a church eventually just becomes a bunch of people doing a bunch of stuff that has no meaning or purpose no matter how many times they say the name of Jesus. And so it's very important for us as a church family to know what we're called to, to know who we are collectively, corporately, together. So as I said, this is week two. The visioning series that we're doing is called The Blessings in the Blessing, which is really just a fun way to say that what we're after is in what we do. Because as Proverbs 29 and 18 says, if people can't see what God's doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what He reveals, they are most blessed. So last week, what we did is we talked a little bit about how just like it is for us as individuals in the kingdom of God, what we're called to do as a church comes out of how God has shaped us as a church, right? Your shape determines your ministry. So your spiritual gifts, your passions, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences make you uniquely qualified and equipped for a specific ministry in the kingdom of God. This is your purpose and your calling in God's kingdom. And the same is true of local churches. You see, God brings to each church family the people who have the right spiritual gifts, passions, abilities, personalities, and experiences to accomplish a specific purpose and mission that is our church's calling in the kingdom of God. Now, we also added last week that just like an individual's purpose in the kingdom is always going to be in line with what God has called every Christian to do, the local church's calling will also always be in line with what God has called the whole church to do and to be. Which, if you remember, as we said at the beginning of service, is exalting God, edifying the saints, and evangelizing the world. Which we put another way, didn't we? We said it is like reaching up, reaching in, and reaching out. And put like this, this is easy to understand, right? It's simple. It's easy to remember. We can, at a glance, we can look at it, and we can see whether or not what we're doing actually fits with what God says the church exists for. And I encouraged you last week to be praying throughout this week about what God may be saying to you as you reflect on these three purposes that you're called to. Now, today. Today we're going to move on by taking a much closer look at who we are as a local body and what that means for the emerging vision. So, one of the things that's actually really cool about being a pastor is that I'm usually the guy that most people come to when they have maybe seen something or heard something that they believe is coming from God gives them an opportunity to unpack that in a safe space without judgment, and and I can often help them sort of figure out whether or not that may be coming from God. So it's a good thing, and I actually really appreciate that. But it's also a really great thing for me, because see, when people do that, it gives me this incredible gift in, in being able and being invited in to see what God is saying to a whole bunch of people in our church family and maybe see some of the things that God is showing the people in our church family. And that's an incredible blessing for me as a leader because it's kind of like having your finger on the pulse. Oh, that's that's great. (laughs) We're going to get a new mic next week. Uh, (laughs) Because it allows me to kind of see and hear what's going on between God and and the body in a widespread way. Now, the reason I'm starting with all of this today is because since I arrived here almost five years ago now, there are two images that this in this church and of this church that I keep hearing about from people. And by that I mean from multiple sources, both inside and outside of our church family, and to make sure that I am perfectly clear about it, 
What I'm saying is, is that people have kept coming to me throughout all this time telling me about visions they have seen about our church and words they've received from God about their church that they believe are coming from God. And of all the things over the years that people have told me that they think God is saying or showing them about our church, there are two that I keep on hearing. Two over and over again. Actually, you know what? Give me that. Oh, no, we can't do it like that. I'm going to this thump buzz. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate the support. That's amazing because it's annoying the hooey out of me. <laughs> yeah, you can tell, right? It's just like coming at me. All right. I'm going to try not to stress. <laughs> of all the things that people have revealed to me that they claim God has been showing them or saying to them, there are two that continue to come up again and again and again. One of them is an image that people have seen, either a vision or dream, vision that people have seen about this church. Another is a word that they have heard about our church, and they believe that both are coming from God. Now, i got to say, in and of themselves, you need to know that dreams, visions, even words that uh, one believes may have been coming from God uh, they are certainly something to be taken seriously, but they are also something that we need to take cautiously, right? Because our enemy, the devil, our enemy is a master manipulator, and he has supernatural power. So we do want to be careful if we're hearing something and we think it's supernatural. If it's coming from God, well, that's kind of an important thing to know, isn't it? The first thing that we should always do whenever we see something or hear something that we believe is coming from God is put it up against the scriptures just to make sure. If it is consistent with God's word, there's another balance, and that is us. Check and balance. What I mean by this is if you look in Proverbs 11 and 14, it says this, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And then again in Proverbs 12 and 15, it says, The way of fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. We have each other, don't we? So anytime we're dealing with something that we're not certain of, we can take the matter to a trusted elder. It might be a pastor. It might be a mentor in the faith. Someone who has the experience, the maturity, the wisdom to speak into what you've experienced and pray with you about it. And perhaps, maybe even, affirm whether or not they believe it to be from God. It's an incredibly important practice. I have many of these people in my life. Many. Whenever I'm not absolutely certain of a matter, I take it to them and I ask them, what do you think? This is what I've heard. Sometimes it's as simple as a decision I need to make. I have this on my plate. What do you think? I take it to them and I see what they've heard because those people have a proven track record of spiritual maturity, service to God, and most importantly in this case, hearing from him. But there's still another measure that we can uh, use that will help us understand whether or not what we're seeing or hearing is actually coming from God, especially when it relates to our calling and purpose in the kingdom. And that is to consider the vision or the word in the context of how God has shaped you or us. Right? In other words, we ask the question, is what I'm seeing or what I'm hearing consistent with how God has shaped and equipped me? Does that make sense? Like, because because let's face it, if if uh, if I go and I suddenly have this vision that I'm supposed to quit my job here and go be a government file clerk or move down south and breed tarantulas, I know that's not God, right? Because I am not at all wired to spend my days in a basement somewhere filing paper, and no one should be breeding tarantulas. Am I right? Yeah. So I know those things would not be coming from God. So sometimes just looking at, our, at, at what we're gifted at um, and how we're wired can make that easier to understand. All fun aside, I think you understand what I'm saying. God empowers us. God equips us. And then he calls us to ministry that requires those particular gifts, passions, abilities, personalities, and experiences. 
it is highly unlikely to the point of ridiculousness that God would ever empower and equip someone and prepare them for a ministry and then call them to something they have no skill, gifting, or whatever at. Does that make sense to you? Right. So all of this to say, even back years ago when I first began hearing about visions, hearing about words that people had that they believed had been coming from God about this church, I would pray about them and see if they had agreement in my own spirit. And then I would run them through each of these checks, looking for affirmation. And after four and a half years, more than that, there have been two that have not only found agreement in my spirit and made it through each of these, but they have also come to me from separate sources multiple times over a great deal of time. One is a vision, a dream people have had. The other is a word, as I said. And in this case, I do mean a single word. It's pretty incredible to me. Because this sometimes is how God speaks to us. Now, before we talk about what those two things are, I'd like us to do something first. This is a simple exercise of self-awareness, corporately speaking. So as a church, it's just about knowing who we are. Because, you know, our purpose and mission flows out of who we are, right? Right? So rather than just me telling you what I hear, what I think, et cetera, et cetera, I'd like to hear from you. This is where I was going to have you run around, but now I have the mic, so we're going to do it differently. You're off the hook. He's smiling. I want to ask you what you think. When you think of this church, whether you're here or elsewhere when it happens, What are some of the positive things that pop into your mind or your heart when you think about this church family? I don't want you to dig deep and consider it too much, right? I I want this to be almost a knee-jerk reaction. What do you think of? What, What images pop into your head? What feelings rise to the surface? And also, don't let your mind go back in time. We are not the church we once were. I want to hear in one or two words what it feels like to you nowadays when you walk through those doors into the fellowship that is this church family, and for an example, when I think of this church, wherever I may be, I think of a hug. Because this church, to me, feels warm. It feels comforting. It feels safe to me, spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally. God's goodness is here, and I feel that. And it feels almost like, a, like I'm being wrapped around. You follow me? So that's how I want to do it. Just one or two words. And I want to see your hands. So I'll point at you. We're going to have to yell it out. So, so, and I'll repeat it in the mic. So, it's Service. Because you, you see it, right? You see people offering their time, their energy, right? She said service. You hear that? Kindness. I hear that so much from people that come and visit, like family comes from wherever at Christmas time, and they say, everybody seems so kind here. Uh, Lisa, was it Lisa? Yeah, I saw Lisa's hand. That's so good. Accepting. So whoever didn't hear, she said it pretty loud, but whoever didn't hear Lisa, she said predestined love, love, accepting, Joe said accepting, calling there's a draw right you you can feel that right how about someone I want to ask some of the people that haven't been coming as long as maybe some of the others belonging belonging see what what's great about this is I'm watching all your faces as people are putting up their hands and saying words I'm watching what's happening in you and it's pretty cool I must say other, there were other hands. I peripherally said, oh, there's actually quite a few. I'll, I'll get you first. Energy. Sorry, it's my fault. No, I, <laughs> ADHD, they get, I'm medicated. It'll get better. No, I'm, <laughs> but no, but that's true. That's wonderful. Every time I get up here, most weeks, don't I get up here and one of the first thing out of my mouth is you feel that? Like the, because you're absolutely right. You feel it too, don't you? Yeah. Rosemary? Freedom. 
I want to unpack that, actually, because that's... But yeah, I'm not going to. That's huge. Freedom. Nathan. Home. Home. I'm going to... I don't... Yeah, okay. One more. I'll take one more, Wendy, just because I saw you before I said it. Happy people. Okay. (laughs) I deleted the slide. I can't believe I deleted the slide. It, It was starting to get too slidey. So I deleted a slide. (laughs) And now I'm thinking, I really, really, really shouldn't have done that. Even if these particular words weren't the particular words that you yourself thought in your head, in the moment I asked the question, when you heard the words people were saying about our church family, did your heart or your spirit have agreement with what they were saying? You can just nod your head, yeah, so... Because I feel that too, more than that, because I know something you don't know right now. See, for almost five years, one of the things I've been doing is listening very intently. Sometimes you don't notice, but I listen, even just peripheral conversation to hear as people are talking about the church, I listen to what the heartbeat of that is. And, and before I read this, I want to show you, I actually wrote this down yesterday, Friday, and then more yesterday. Over the past five years, these are the predominant things only. So the things people say most often. I've had people tell me that our church makes them feel at home. I've had people tell me that it makes them feel like they belong. I've had people tell me they feel welcome and accepted, just as they are. Many have told me that they feel loved here in a way they haven't anywhere else. And that's pretty significant when you understand that a lot of these people tried other churches first. Perhaps more than any other single comment that I have heard over the time that I've been here coming from people about our church is that it feels sincere about its care for them. That for us, it's not just something we say, but something we do. Service, right? We love one another actively. Authentic is the word I hear most often. But I also hear a lot that right away, right away, people, and I mean immediately first-timers, come through the door and they feel that belonging. Probably more than anything else. There's a peace here. They feel good. They feel free. They can be who they are. They're accepted. They're loved. And they can grow and learn what that means. And every single one of these things came out of your mouths just a moment ago. So it's not me, right? And I want to be clear about that because sometimes it's easy to see the guy standing on the stage and say, well, he's just saying that. It's not me saying that. Because y'all just said it, right? (laughs) Y'all. This is pretty amazing to me because it isn't necessarily who we were five years ago either, is it? But as I'm going to show you, this is kind of what God has been saying about our church family all along. And keep in mind that both the reoccurring vision that people have been having and the reoccurring word that people have been hearing both started even long before I got here. The first first I heard was actually a vision that someone had seen of this church. They told me when I had been here about one month, but they had had the vision ages before that. So God has been speaking into this church for a long, long time. Some of the people that he has been speaking to are in our church family right now in this room. Some of them are not a part of our church family. And yet I continue even to this time to hear about this same vision from different people and this same word connected to our church. Now, to be completely fair, just because somebody sees something or hears something, even if it is coming from God does not suddenly mean that it becomes a collective vision or ministry or purpose of the church family. I mean, it could just be an encouragement, yes? But this image has been seen by far too many people, and the word has been expressed and spoken to for too long to be ignored. And it should be something we pay attention to, and at the very least, something that we are praying about.
the vision that a number of people have had about our church is of a great pillar of light. Some have seen the people gathered outside with the light just blasting into the heavens from them. Some of them have seen the physical church building and stuff with the same column of light reaching up as far as one can see, like a beacon into the heavens that can be seen from everywhere, drawing, specifically they've all said this, drawing people into it. Several people have seen this over way more than five years. I've been here almost five, and this has been, this started a long time ago. This is the image that God has been showing people. Now I want to show you something. Philippians 2, 14 to 15, the Apostle Paul said, Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Leave, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. In Ephesians 5, 8, and 10, the Apostle Paul said, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. And of course, in Matthew 5, 14, and 16, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. For a long time now, I have heard Christians talk about these passages about being light in the world and say that they're meant to remind us not to conceal our faith from others. I disagree. I have always disagreed. I believe these passages are clearly talking about making sure that we display God's love and his work so that people know it's him doing it. Do you see that? In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. I believe that we are, as a church, called to a higher purpose of intentionally making the love of God and the work that he's doing in this world visible in our community and beyond so that people see that it's him doing it. So that he's the one that gets the glory. I believe that that pillar of light that people have seen and keep seeing, including myself, is a visual image of that calling. Now the word, the word that people have continued to hear over all this time is the word sanctuary. I've heard it from a number of sources, both inside and outside the church. I've heard it over a spread of time, and I've heard it in a number of different contexts. A few of them were people like, he was talking to me, and he kept saying this stuff. And what they described was sanctuary, even sometimes when they didn't say the word. But I've heard this particular word drop so many times. In fact, years ago when I was at one of the uh, pastoral prayer retreats up at Wesley Acres, another pastor and I went for a walk one day uh, just to spend some time together and, you know, talk with one another. And as we walked and talked, I talked about all of you behind your back. See, I was telling him about all of you and the heart that I see in you as a church family, and I was mentioning to him about how excited and encouraged I was in my spirit about the days ahead because I truly believed that our church family was about to step into something incredible, a future that was unlike what we knew. And as I talked to him about it, and I talked about this great hope that I felt about our future, suddenly he turns to me and he says this, and I quote, that's because your church is a sanctuary. More and more people are going to be drawn to it. Now, here's the thing about him saying that word in that moment, because I never told him what anybody had said to me. I never mentioned that I had been hearing this word from people. And at that time, at least, there's no way he could have heard it from anybody here either, at least at that point. 
So in that moment, when he said that, my knees almost gave out. Because it affirmed for me what I already believed in my spirit, that this was a legitimate word for our church family. You see, in Scripture, the word sanctuary is used a lot. And the sanctuary is the place where God is. It's the place where God lives in this world to be close to his people. But it is no longer a room in a building. He lives in us. We are God's sanctuary. We're the temple, right? 1 Corinthians 3.16, for example, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? 2 Corinthians 6 and 16 says, for you are God's temple, the home of the living God. And God has said of you, I will live in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, because so many different people, including myself, have heard this word from God, understanding that it's about our church family, I believe that we are being called to intentionally be the living sanctuary that his word describes. And because I also believe that that pillar of light that has been seen by so many, including me, over such a long time, I believe that's a sign that we are called to that higher purpose of intentionally making the love of God and the work that he's doing in this world visible in our community and beyond so that people see it's him doing it. So given the way that so many people have spoken about our church family and how it makes them feel and what experiences they've had in worship with us, coupled with this vision that so many have seen over such a grand time and the word that so many have heard over such a long time, At the very, very least, when it comes to our church family's purpose, it is clear to me, at least, that Smith Falls Free Methodist Church exists to be a living sanctuary, demonstrating the love of Jesus for all people, to all people, letting our light shine before them that they may see the work of his hand and glorify our Father in heaven. Read that. And as you read that, hear this. Don't just read that. Think about it. And don't just think about it. Pray about it. And don't just pray about it. Test it. I'm serious. Take this to God. Bring it to him in prayer and ask him about it. I have always said, don't take my word for anything. Always take it to him. Because you need to go to God with this. Because this isn't just some generic statement about the church that you go to. This is a statement about who we are as a church. So it is about who you are as this church. So think about it, and pray about it, and test it, and take it to God on your knees. Now, we still have so much that we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. But today, I'm asking you to pray hard into this this coming week. This is good 